Good evening. Welcome to Southside Bible Church. Thanks for joining us tonight for our Good Friday service as we remember the cross of Christ. And if you have your Bibles, you want to turn with us to Mark chapter 15. We're going to look at verses 22 to 32 tonight. As we gather together like believers all across the world, all around the world tonight to remember the cross in anticipation of the resurrection on Sunday morning. And so it's really our privilege to do this, to do it together, to come back to the central focus of the cross as a church, as individuals, and stay there for this evening and be encouraged and be, be strengthened and, and, and have our hearts really pointed to Christ through the work that he did for us on the cross. Let's pray for our time and then we'll read our text. Father, thank you for this great privilege to be together tonight as a church and remember the cross of Jesus Christ. And we pray that your spirit would help us as we study your word, as we open up these texts and we consider the, the single greatest sacrifice the world has ever known. God, thank you for the cross. And we pray for all of our hearts that we would be strengthened in Christ, that we'd be built up in Christ as we gaze upon the transaction in which you sacrificed your son so that we could go free. God, help us to do that reverently and humbly and, and even joyfully because the outcome has been so great. You have brought us to yourself and you've reconciled us to you through this cross. And, and now we're your children and we rejoice to walk by faith and follow you and call Christ our Savior and our Lord and our friend and so bless our time together tonight. Use it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Beginning in Mark 15, 22. Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with transgressors. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, ha, ha. You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him we're also insulting him. In John 129, John the Baptist, the greatest Old Testament prophet, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As he began and inaugurated the ministry of Christ by pointing to him and saying, He's the one who's come to save us. And tonight, my goal is that we would behold the Lamb when he's taking away the sin of the world that we would gaze at the text and what the text is pointing us to and we would see all that Christ is doing on the cross while he's taking away the sins of the world. Last year, I went back to my hometown in Virginia to the very house that I was born in and my wife and I, we just got out and we were just walking around the neighborhood and there was something so powerful about going back home to that house. I hadn't been there for 30 years and, and just seeing it and peeking around and looking at the back of the house and seeing the trees that I climbed and the, the, the doorstep that my parents brought me home from the hospital. And I'm sure you have memories like that. There's a place where you go back to and it just floods memories and identity and purpose, and that this is where it began for me. And tonight in, 
in many ways, I want us to come home to the cross, to the greater identity, to the greatest identity, because it's, it's home to us. Because the cross defines us. It's our hope. It's our joy. It's the place that Jesus bought us. Where he bought me with his blood and he purchased my pardon forever. God would have us come home to the cross often. It's why he built into the rhythm of the church the Lord's Supper, which we'll partake of tonight. And we never get past the cross. I'll never, I'll never get past that house that I was born in. It, it's just linked to me forever. I'm, it's inseparable from my identity growing up. And we'll never get past the cross. We never live beyond it. And so tonight, I hope corporately we can humbly and thankfully come to the foot of the cross and take it all in again. Christ dying for sinners and be encouraged and be strengthened that this is our king and this is what our king did to take sin completely out of the way so that we could have peace with God. 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And that's our confession tonight. The power of God demonstrated at the cross where he took away the penalty of our sin and he broke the power of sin. If you're not a Christian tonight, or you're not sure if you're a Christian tonight, I would ask, I would beg that for these moments that you set aside what you think about the cross and let's just come to the Bible and let's hear God tell us what the cross is all about. Let's together just hear the word of God because the cross matters for all of us. It's the only hope of heaven for sinners. And the Bible says that we're all sinners and so we all certainly need this hope. Instead of a formal outline tonight, I want to present three themes in our text. They really stood out to me as I studied them. And those three themes are this. The first theme is irony. The second is mockery. And the third is mercy. Irony is defined this way. A state of affairs or an event that seems deliberately contrary to what one expects and is often amusing as a result. Now, there is nothing amusing about the cross. There's nothing more serious than the cross. But the cross is incredibly ironic. It's completely unexpected by everyone. And so why would God use irony, which I think he does, and I'll try to show it in the text. Why would God use irony when it comes to something so pivotal as the moment that he is sacrificing his son for our sin? I think for this reason, when God acts and when his plan unfolds and it's completely unexpected by humanity, and we are shocked and surprised by what is transpiring in redemptive history, God gets all the glory. It separates him from us, and it elevates him above us as the only wise God. And so the cross is incredibly ironic. So that we stand back, and, and corporately we would say this, and individually in our hearts we would say this, only God would do this. Only God does it this way, and he alone gets the glory for doing it this way. The, the cross is deliberately contrary to what humanity expected. A dying Messiah, a humble God, free grace. God's glory, in some sense, is always an unexpected glory. And, and that's fitting because he's God, he's unique. He's holy. 1 Corinthians 1.21, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom. 
But we preach Christ crucified. To Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And so the first theme I want us to see as we work through our text, and we'll, we'll do it chronologically, is the irony of the cross. Because irony reveals God in his glory. The second theme in this text is mockery. There are lots of insults recorded in these verses. In the midst of the irony, humanity doesn't just misunderstand the cross. They hate it. They oppose it with malice. And in recording this for us, as the Spirit of God has, we get a deeper sense of the human condition. This is who we are apart from Christ. The crowds weren't just confused. They were ravenous for Christ. They wanted him to die. And as he died, they wanted to mock him into the grave. We don't in any way want to excuse ourselves from the crowd. Irony reveals the glory of God. Mockery reveals the heart of man. And then thirdly, mercy. The cross defines mercy for us. What kind of God would do this? That would go to these lengths to save his people. A God of infinite mercy. Of grace. And so throughout our text tonight, Jesus is silent. Like a lamb led to the slaughter. His very presence on the cross is his mercy. And his restraint to neither come down from the cross or to destroy the mockers shows what kind of savior Jesus really is. We have a merciful, merciful high priest. And I hope we see that clearly tonight. And so we have irony revealing God, mockery revealing mankind, and mercy merging the two. Mercy saves sinners, and that's what we, knew, we need, and that's what we have in Christ. And so look with me in Mark chapter 15, verse 22, and let's, let's see those themes unfold through our passage tonight. Verse 22, then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. Outside the city gate, perhaps a hill that looked like a skull or was known as a location for executions, it was most likely in an intersection that people would pass by and witness. The Latin translation is Calvary, and why it was named that and where exactly it was, we don't really know, but we know this. It was a place of death. It wasn't a place of celebration or sightseeing. It was a place where the lives of certain kinds of criminals, the worst of the criminals, would die an agonizing and humiliating death for all to see. It was a place for a bloody spectacle to occur. And so they brought him to this place to die. And as we, we studied Mark in the youth group, this is the text actually we're supposed to be at last Sunday. This was no surprise to Jesus. He came for this reason. They brought him to the place, but he came to this place to die. He knew full well he was going to die. And he had been telling his disciples multiple times in multiple places that he was coming to die. Even in the recent weeks, Mark 10, 33, Jesus says, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. And will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. Jesus came to die. He was born to die, and his death was motivated by two very particular expressed motivations in the Bible. And the first is this. He came to die out of love for his father. In obedience to God the Father's redeeming purposes. And second, he came to die out of love for us. They brought him to die, but he came to die willingly. That, that first motivation is in John 14, 31. In the upper room, Jesus says, But so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up, let us go from here. And they depart that night from the upper room for the, 
for the road to Gethsemane and then the trial and then ultimately his death. He's doing exactly as the Father commanded him because he loves the Father perfectly. And then secondly, Galatians 2.20. This is the motivation of Christ specific to us. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. With those two motivations, Jesus is moving towards the cross. And tonight we have him on the cross. And these motivations are wonderfully displayed throughout our text tonight as he remains on the cross. Look at verse 23. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. It seemed to be a custom in Jerusalem that the women of the city would offer those being crucified a pain-numbing mixture of wine and myrrh. Myrrh was a plant sap that has anesthetic properties. It has a narcotic effect. And so it was a ministry of the women out of their compassion for these criminals being crucified to try to help them take the edge off the cross. Which shows, I think, how utterly terrifying the cross was. That the worst of the criminals, the women of the city still, still, we've got to help them somehow because it's so unbearable to watch. But the text says this very simply, Jesus didn't take it. He didn't drink it. And the question is, why not? Why not take the edge off just a little bit while you suffer so horribly nailed to a cross? The answer, I think, is very clearly this, because Jesus would face the cross and all of its pain and every drop of the cup of God's wrath with no external help with no aid, with no medicine. He would suffer the punishment of hell with full experience, with full knowledge. He would not drink a cup with even a few drops of mercy in it as he drank the cup of no mercy from the Father, full wrath. And so there's a, there's a focus to Christ here. He's on a mission. His purpose is not comfort, it's atonement, full atonement. Because there will be no medicine in hell. There will be no pain relief in hell. No narcotics. No help. And so Jesus hung on the cross, fully exposed to the physical and emotional and spiritual pain of the agonies of hell. Spurgeon says it this way. There is a glorious idea couched in the fact that the Savior put the murdered wine cup entirely away from his lips. On the heights of heaven, the Son of God stood of old, and he looked down and measured how far it was to the utmost, utmost depths of misery. He cast up the sum total of all the agonies which a man must endure to descend to the utmost depths of pain and misery. He determined that to be a faithful high priest and also to be a suffering one, he would go the whole way, from the highest to the lowest, from the highest throne in glory to the cross of deepest woe. This murdered cup would have stopped him within a little of the utmost limit of misery. Therefore, he said, I will not stop halfway, but I will go all the way. And if this cup can mitigate my sorrow, that is just the reason why I will not drink it. For I have determined that to the utmost, utmost links of misery, I will go. That I will do and bear and suffer all that incarnate God can bear for my people in my own mortal body. It hurts us deeply to know of someone we love experiencing pain. And it hurts more to know that they would choose that pain for us on our behalf. And the fact that they would choose more pain, or in some sense, all of the pain, hurts even more. 
the depths of that kind of love in the Christ on the cross for us. The only response to that pain suffered on our behalf, the only reasonable response is to not despise that pain by rejecting the reason for which it was suffered. Jesus died so we would go free. And so go free tonight if you don't know Christ. Receive this Christ and believe him and go free. He suffered for this very purpose, for this very reason, to take away the penalty of our sin. And so why would anyone remain lost in their sins tonight with a Christ like this, refusing pain relief so that he could drink the full cup with full awareness? Jesus chose the full agony of the cross so that we would never taste one drop of the cross. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. Our worthy response to a crucified Christ is to come to God through Christ tonight. Verse 24, and they crucified him. Surprisingly, I think shockingly, this is all Mark has to say about the physical horrors of the cross. They just crucified him. His first century readers would know the suffering of having your body nailed to a cross and hung there to die. There's so much to say about the agonies of crucifixion, what it really is, what it really does medically to a person. But Mark doesn't say any of it. In fact, it's, it's not a focus in any of the Gospels. Crucifixion was said to be like dying a thousand deaths. The Roman statesman Cicero said of crucifixion that it was the most cruel and disgusting punishment and suggested that the very mention of the cross should be far removed, not only from a Roman citizen's body, but from his mind, his eyes, his ears. Cicero says, it's so horrific, don't even think about the cross. And God tonight in Mark 15 is telling us just the opposite. Think about the cross. The word excruciating literally means out of crucifying. And just an observation, not a criticism per se, but much of modern evangelicalism has emphasized the physical brutality of the cross. And so there's movies and there's descriptions and it's just a bloody, horrific, gory mess. And yet what God has recorded for us in our text and in the rest of the New Testament, I think, is noticeably void of these physical horrors. The Bible simply says, and they crucified him. Not to in any way lessen the brutality of the cross. The cross was extreme. But the full agony of the cross was infinitely worse than just that, and the majority of the cross was unseen. Jesus doesn't cry out, my God, my God, it hurts. My hands, my feet. Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The wrath of God poured out on the Son for sin was at the essence of the brutality of the cross. That was the epicenter of the nuclear bomb going off at Calvary. In the midst of all the physical pain, it was the pain of being forsaken by God, cursed by God. Because in those moments, Jesus had become sin for us. And he was enduring wrath unseen, wrath unimaginable. And so we can weep at the cross. We can weep at the cross because an innocent man is being brutalized beyond imagination. But so were the other two guys. But the fullness of the scene tells us that this is the price of sin. And it's more than physical pain. Infinitely more. R.C. Sproul said this, 
But I really doubt if Jesus could even feel the physical pain. That's his speculation, but this is his reasoning. Because it wasn't worthy to compare to the pain that he had to endure while he is receiving the very punishment of hell that you and I deserve. What I'm saying is that the nails and the swords were nothing compared to coming under the curse of God. And I ask you to think about that, to think about what it would be like for you to be cursed of God, which indeed you will be if you do not receive and trust in the one who has taken that curse for you. Verse 24 continues. And divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. In the the Roman culture, the soldiers were permitted to take the possessions of those that they executed. So if you drove the nails, you got the belongings. It's in fulfillment of Psalm 22, 18. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Everyone dies materially empty. Even the Son of God. This is the human experience of death, which says volumes for us about what we should be living for. It's certainly not stuff. Ecclesiastes 5.15, speaking generally about mankind. As he had come naked from his mother's womb, so will he return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. And so we have the soldiers, and they've stripped Christ down, and they've beat him and mocked him. And now as he, as he hangs dying on the cross, they're rolling dice and casting lots to get his stuff. The remnant of his earthly belongings. And there's something so twisted about that, so sickening about that. They're pillaging the Son of God as he's dying. I find it very ironic that God himself is the sovereign author of the odds. God determines the roll of the dice, the casting of the lot. Such irony at the cross that God would ordain even the dividing up of his son's garments among the men who nailed him to the cross for their common use, for their own benefit. Proverbs 16, 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. And I find it further ironic in the fact that they are taking the garments of Christ to use for themselves. For their own purposes, these mundane pieces of fabric, and Jesus is dying for sin, that he might clothe all who put their trust in him with better garments, with clothes of righteousness. He was disrobed at the cross to pay sin's penalty so that he might clothe us with the finest garments the world has ever seen, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 61.10. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord, for my soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Galatians 3.27, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. In this life, I am not known in any way for my fashion sense. Costco can't get you very far. But all of us tonight who believe the gospel of Jesus Christ are so wonderfully dressed up, perfectly attired for the grandest occasion. He has dressed us for heaven, clothes that free us to walk right through judgment, completely justified into the very presence of God. He was stripped down that we might be dressed up. And so don't be found naked tonight. That this Christ, when this Christ is giving away free clothes, forgiveness and righteousness in him. Do you know what is really inappropriate attire before God? Any attempt at righteousness to gain his favor, 
to gain something before him, to draw his attention to, to be acceptable to God, very inappropriate attire before God. Because only Christ is acceptable to God, and all who look to him by faith are made acceptable in him through the gospel. And so don't be found naked tonight when there's a huge wardrobe free of charge just for faith in Christ. Verse 25, it was the third hour when they crucified him. The trial occurs at six, his crucifixion at nine, his death at three. Jewish time was marked from sunrise, and in John's gospel, he's marking time uh, according to the Roman time, marking it from midnight. Verse 26 says, The inscription of the charge against him read, The king of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. The inscription over the cross was written in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. And each gospel translates a, a bit of it, a little bit differently, but a, a portion of it. You put them all together. The full testimony of all the gospel accounts, the full inscription reads this, this way. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. It's Pilate's jab at the Jews. Here's your king. We'll just call him the king, put it up over the cross. In John 19, the chief priests protest what Pilate wrote. They want him to say only that Jesus said he was the king, not that he was the king. And Pilate refuses, and he says, I've written what I've written. And so it stays. And the inscription above Christ at the cross is likewise very ironic. Because nothing could be more true that Jesus is the king of the Jews. But it was written as untrue. It was written as mockery. It really was a political stunt between rival nations. He certainly doesn't look like a king hanging on the cross. It's very unexpected that he would claim to be the king. But the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the king of kings and lord of lords. And it presses us to wrestle with what kind of king is our Christ? Especially with this scene of the cross. Kings don't, have, don't hang bloodied on crosses. They don't get beaten and mocked and crucified. They tell other people to do that. But our king was. And this Christ on the cross is our king. And he's very much not like any other king. He's meek and he's lowly and he's a servant. And dare we even say a servant to sinners like us. Laying down his life to pay a ransom for our pardon. Our king is humble. Our king loves us and has mercy on us. And our king set out to redeem his people and he did just that at great cost. What kind of king is this? Our king will die on Friday and rise on Sunday in glorious victory. There's no king like our king. And what was inscribed above his head in mockery at the cross will be the theme of heaven forever. Our king rules and he reigns. And he will die on this cross in shame. But on Sunday he will rise as the only conqueror of death and hell. And, and hell. And then he'll come for us because he loves us. He loves us with an everlasting love and he will shield us in judgment and he will take us home to heaven to be with him in his kingdom for all eternity. And when he comes back, there will be no irony when we see this king in all his glory come on that day. Verse 28, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with transgressors. In Mark's gospel, verse 28, is, if you see in your footnote, it's not in the early manuscripts, but it is in Luke twenty two thirty seven, 37, and Jesus quotes from Isaiah 53, 12. And so it's true, and it was fulfilled. He was numbered with transgressors, a criminal on each side, but maybe, maybe not in this passage. But the translators included it. 
And the question is, why was he numbered with transgressors? And it's because at the cross, God treated him as a transgressor, as he put our sin on him and punished him with the full wrath of God. And then finally, I want to, I want to close out with just a general review of chapter 15 as we head into these final verses. In, in chapter 15, Mark records four distinct groups of people that mock Christ. Those who mocked Jesus at the cross that day were the soldiers, the people passing by, the religious leaders, and these two criminals crucified next to Jesus. These are the ones that are hurling the insults, that are just saying awful things and yelling and screaming at Christ. And in some sense, this is a good slice of culture, right? This is a good representation. You've got common people, religious people, military people, and criminals, all of them are demanding that Jesus do something to save himself based on who he said he was. They're mocking him because they don't believe in him. And they find it ridiculous that he would claim to be the son of God and allow this to happen to him, to be executed. Their mockery is prophesied in Psalm 22, 7. But look with me in verse 29 of our text. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. From 29 to 32, Mark is painting a very clear picture for us, and it's this. While Jesus hangs on a cross, dying for sin, drinking the full cup of God's wrath, when we are at the pivotal point of God's redeeming plan, punishing Christ so we could go free, humanity is laughing Humanity is mocking and reviling and insulting and wagging their heads like children make fun of each other on a playground. When God is saving, humanity treats the whole thing as a joke, as a farce. It disrupts them and they hate it. I have to confess, the more and more I studied this passage, the more I felt embarrassed to be human. But this is who we are. And as God reaches down to save, those present at the single greatest expression of divine love for sinners, they are hurling insults at Christ. And the text says they're passing by, continuing on with their journey, like, like some kind of a drive-by mocking like they just saw an accident, and they yelled a few words and then went on their way. Like the whole thing was so trivial and so unimportant. Ironic. The whole world should have been standing at attention or bowing in worship and awe at the cross. But instead, they're acting like a bunch of children who need a spanking. The picture is shocking, and it's supposed to be shocking. That's why Mark, layer upon layer, is showing different, different walks of life there at the cross, losing their minds over Jesus dying. Sin and unbelief is shocking. But this is who we are in our sin. Apart from Christ, this is who I am, a mocker. They mock the God who made us. They mock what is most precious to God the Father, the Christ who was laying down his very life to save. Does the doctrine of sin need any other illustration than the audience present at the cross? But when men were at their worst, God was at his best. And the mercy of the cross is only highlighted by the behavior of the crowd. And Jesus says nothing in response. The mocking of the crowd, it vindicates the wisdom and the glory of the cross. And no one understands it, and no one gets it. The common theme among everyone that's mocking is that we don't believe 
who you are and who you say you are, because if you were, you would simply come down and you would leap off that cross in victory and it would all be over. The irony is this. Jesus had no intention of saving himself because he's there to save us. And so when they cry out, save yourself and come down from the cross, it's Jesus staying on the cross that will save us. It's a complete reversal of the intent of the cross. They should have been pleading for him to stay on the cross. But they didn't understand what he was doing. Because if Jesus comes down from the cross, all of humanity goes to hell. If he saves himself, we all die in our sin. Look in verse 32. Chief priests and scribes, the text says they mocked him among themselves. How pious. They say the same things. They just do it in the religious way, privately. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Think of the ridiculousness of this question. Come down, then we will see and believe. They make this demand of Christ. Even after all that they had seen, all the miracles, they'd seen Lazarus raised from the dead. They even acknowledge in verse 31 that he did, in fact, save others. After all that, they demand that Jesus come down from the cross as their sign, and then they would believe. Their mockery is ironic because they were witnessing at that very moment the very sign that God had given for their unbelief. Jesus on the cross was the sign. And they were rejecting it. They wanted a different sign according to how they thought Jesus should prove, them, prove himself. Think of Matthew 12. 38 to 40. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign. And yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. We need no other sign than this tonight. You need no other sign. If you keep kicking this can down the road of not believing the gospel, demanding that God do something unique for you, that he come to you in a vision, that he speak to you audibly, the Bible would say, God would say, repent. This is sufficient. Jesus said what the sign would be. He gave the sign. It is enough. Believe the gospel. The demand for further signs or specific signs is a power play with the God of the universe, and that never ends well. You'll never believe the cross of Christ and see its full glory until you agree with the premise of the cross and put your own premise away. And the premise of the cross is this, that you and I are sinners. And God has provided the cross to save sinners and until you believe that, you will make all sorts of demands of God to accommodate your preferences. The reality is, is that you and I are sinners, and you and I are separated from God, and only the blood of Christ could bridge that gap. And those who see their sin and their condemnation before God, they stop demanding of God, and they simply say thank you, and they come, and they believe the gospel. And they see the cro cross as their only hope. Our text concludes with this shocking statement in verse 32. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. As I think about these two thieves, robbers, they were probably tied in with Barabbas, probably insurrectionists. As I think about them and what they're experiencing dying on the cross, next to Jesus. I struggle to believe that it is even possible that they were mocking Jesus too. Two criminals on the cross mocking Christ. That is, 
the depravity of the human heart. And this last sentence, I think, is the exclamation point on the mockery section that Mark is unfolding. With nails in my hands and feet suspended from a cross, suffering in agony the last moments of my life, I can imagine a lot of thoughts could be going through my mind. And mocking the guy next to me doesn't seem to be one of them. This is it. I'm doomed. This hurts really bad. What will be next? They did it. They're killing me for my crimes. I don't think I'm getting out of this today. What about my friends? What about my family? How much longer will I suffer? I imagine there could be some sense of rage against the accusers, but mockery against the Christ? The guy who went around doing good, who was known as the miracle worker, who did all things well and loved sinners? Death seems to have a, a way of humbling a man. Pain and agony. It, it seems that it would shut your mouth, frighten you and quiet you down. But not these two. And so, so out of the overflow of their hearts, they speak. And right there at the end of their lives, their hearts are more concerned about hurting Christ than their own death. They're dying, and with their dying breaths, their, their priority is to mock the Messiah right to the end. This is malicious, resilient, persistent, selfish, evil, sacrificial rebellion against God. And it is who we are, and it is precisely why Jesus came to die for sinners. Jesus died for sin. He died for the worst of sin. And so we can't excuse ourselves from these depths of sin. And the text moves on. Mark finishes the story, but there's no way that we can leave that verse 32 just dangling out there when Luke had a little more to say about it. We know from Luke's account that at some point during the day, one of the thieves changes course. And instead of mocking, he turns to pleading. Instead of insulting Christ, he is suddenly hoping in Christ. He rebukes the other thief, and he asks Jesus a question. He, he says, remember me. Take me with you. When you come into your kingdom, please remember me. Luke 23, 39, one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, do you not even fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. If there ever was a moment in the history of the universe where someone had the right to say, I'm busy and I can't talk to you right now, it was Christ at that moment. To say that Jesus had a lot on his mind would be an understatement of the highest order. He was dying. Hell was upon him. His father had forsaken him. He had become sin for us. The weight couldn't have been heavier, more personal, or more all-consuming. And yet, marvel at what he says. He said to him, truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. In the span of six hours, the thief goes from the lowest of God-hating, Christ-rejecting sinner to child of God with promise of heaven today. Is there a greater picture of grace in the scriptures. This man deserved God's wrath. He brought nothing to the table. His hands weren't full of grace. They were full of metal from the spikes that stuck him to the cross because he had been caught in his sin. He was guilty. He was moments from hell. And Jesus gives him heaven. For what? For free. For the exaltation of his sovereign mercy to the praise of his glory and grace. What an absolutely astounding picture of Christ on the cross. 
His mercy is unstoppable. His love is unbounding. Even among the chaos of the cross, the jeers and the blood and the insults and the suffering and the wrath. When Jesus had every right to say to the thief, no, sorry, it's it's too late. You're too guilty. Just take your last breath and take your punishment. He snatches him from the fires of hell. He pardons him based on his atoning death, which was just about to happen. If there was ever a place in the Bible that preaches to us that Jesus is never too busy or too distracted to save a sinner, it's here. He welcomes a repentant sinner even as he's dying for sin. What a bright light on a dark day. And I know all of us would agree, of course he saves him. That's, that's, that's the Jesus that we know. He's a friend of sinners. He's the hope of nations. It's just like him that he would do it like this at the final hour. As he's seemingly giving all that he is, he would surprise us with more mercy to give more grace and comfort this man with heaven at the final buzzer of life when there just seems like there's, there's no hope at all. That's Christ. And we worship him for it. Tonight, what will you do with this thief and what will you do with this Christ? Does the thief make you angry? And he does for some people. I've had lengthy conversations with people that do not like the thief. It's not fair. He gets paradise. That's it? He just has to turn his head and look at Jesus and say, remember me? And he gets heaven? I'm over here trying my hardest and doing everything I can to be good and do good and do more good, and he gets off like that? Where's the justice in all this? Great question. Great question. Where's the justice in all this? The justice in all of this is right there on the cross next to the thief. As Jesus takes his punishment for him, as Jesus dies for sin, don't ask for justice from the God of the universe. Be thankful for his mercy. If the thief bothers you, there's a good chance you don't know God's grace yet. Because at the end of the day, we're all about to die and we bring nothing more than what the thief brought that day, just sin and guilt. That's how we come to Christ. And we ask by faith for the mercy of God through the gospel of Christ and we plead and we say, will you remember us? And he says, yes. The other response is utter shock that leads to faith brokenness that God would save a dying thief like this guy at this final hour. And so please, please connect the dots tonight. If he would do that for that guy, would he save you tonight? Would he forgive you if you look to Christ in the same way? The cross is evidence that he did, and he does, and he would right now if you asked him. And so if you don't know Christ, ask him. Look to him. Christians, as we finish, this is our home. This is Christ for us. He's so wonderfully for us. Our sin paid for, full atonement. And so this weekend, as we consider the cross to the resurrection, May God strengthen us to be surprised once again at the irony of the cross. Not what we expected, but exactly what we needed. In the midst of mockery, there was mercy. And Jesus stayed the course, and he went all the way, and he drank the full cup. And we don't need to add a thing to it. We just need to look deeply at the cross, believe the love of God for you in Christ, And then let's go live in the freedom that he purchased for us. The freedom of forgiveness and righteousness, free from the fear of hell. The freedom now to love, to know God and walk with Christ intimately. If you look with me in Mark 15, let's just close out the story. Verse 33, when the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, behold, he is calling for Elijah. 
Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave him a drink, saying, Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion, who was standing right in front of him, saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the irony of the cross. Thank you for mercy in the midst of mockery. Thank you for the love of Christ directed perfectly towards the Father and directed perfectly towards his people. God, we rejoice to look at this cross, to look at our Christ and know that this is home. This is where he purchased us. We pray that you would strengthen us for this weekend as we consider all that you have done for us in Christ. God, may we live our lives with great wisdom and redeem this time that you have purchased for us. As we look forward to every moment of eternity, every eternal, infinite joy of heaven that you purchased for us at the cross. God, thank you for your grace. And now as we come to the table, we pray that you would bless us as a church as we remember the death of Christ through the elements. In Jesus' name, amen.